So earlier we talked about you know, breaking down proteins. You might do it because they're damaged, they're aggregating. Um, you know, they're just regulatory or uh, like just as a regulatory thing. Like they've served their purpose and we want them out. But a lot of times it's just we need energy. Um, so in general, maybe like 10% of our energy comes from just, uh, you know, breaking down amino acids. Now, <laughs> that, that's going to be severely ramped up, right? That's not a, that's not a, it's significant, but it's not significant. You're going to break down a lot more if you've been starving for longer. Um, and again, selectively with the KFERQ, uh, Pinta sequence, um, some proteins and some amino acids more than others. But um, so there, there's two different pathways. We break down a protein, we get a bunch of amino acids. We, need, we then need to break these down um, to, to either make ketones, so we have a ketogenic path, or to make glucose, so we have a glucogenic path. Um, Notice that the Krebs cycle is involved here. So with the Krebs cycle, let's say that we have a fixed amount of Krebs intermediate. Maybe just one. Maybe there's just one oxaloacetate. And every time an acetyl-CoA combines and that goes through. But there's a fixed pool. So imagine what happens if we have this or this or this or this. I am now adding one to the pool. I have one extra alpha ketoglutarate or this or this or this. And so you know what? We have one extra one. We can afford to ship this oxaloacetate and make it a glucose and have it leave the cell. Um, so that's why entering here, 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 here is glucogenic. What if we enter uh, over here? Or, or over here, this one's clear, right? Acetoacetate to ketone. That one makes sense. Doesn't even need to explain it. This one, why is it making an acetyl-CoA? Because it seems like it would just go through the entire way and just also make a glucose. Well, because if an acetyl-CoA goes in, again, you gotta remember, we got a fixed pool. If I make an acetyl-CoA and I push that in, I'm and I'm now taking an oxaloacetate, and then that's going all the way around. And then if that leaves, I just lost one oxaloacetate. I'm depleting the pool. So that won't happen. So the point is that if you do this, it's, it's only recourses to make acetoacetate. Now, a lot of things can be ketogenic and glucogenic, right? They have different possibilities that can have one, you know, one entry point or another entry point. Um, but I, I wouldn't know. And then some, so some things are both, some things are ketogenic, some things are just glucogenic. I would just know that leucine and lysine are the ones that are only ketogenic. Um, uh, yeah. So when we do this though, so we're, we're skipping a, like, how do I make this an acetyl coa How do I make that an alpha glutarate? How do I make that acetyl coa Yeah, it doesn't matter, but you, you do need to know there's, you know, Sure is shit not a, a nitrogen in any of these Krebs cycle uh, proteins or uh, uh, molecules. So there's always a deamination reaction. Every time we're doing this, we're taking away a nitrogen. And nitrogen is quite toxic to the body. So the question is, where does the nitrogen go? Um, we have to excrete it. We excrete it. Anytime we need to do some weird metabolic thing, it's going to go to the liver, right? So in the, in the muscles, we might be uh, breaking down a bunch of proteins and breaking down a bunch of amino acids. We have a lot of ammonium. Um, ammonium's toxic, like we said, so we need to get it to the liver so we can do the urea cycle and we can excrete it in the urine, right? Urea, urine. Um, uh, and, and the question is, how do we how do we get it there? And this was just kind of a cute, fun thing. So um, uh, we make urea. Um, us, us mammals. And we have an access to like a medium amount of water. Um, and uh, if you look at something like a fish, fish have tons of water available to them. So they don't actually need to convert the toxic ammonium to less toxic urea because they have so much water they can just dilute it. Something like a bird, on the other hand, has very little uh, water. So they, they're going to have to have something that's even less toxic than urea. That's definitely not in your test. I just I'm a nerd, thought that was funny or interesting. Um, so urea cycle happens the liver. How do we get it there? <laughs> the suspense is killing everybody. Uh, it's through something called the, the Cahill cycle. Um, so this is how we get st you know, nitrogen from the muscles uh, to the liver. Um, and to understand this, to really have it like click, you have to understand how glutamate acts as like a storage for ammonium. We need to know what the heck is a transaminase reaction. We need to know about alanine playing the role of the friendly shuttle, the vessel it takes nitrogen through the blood. And then we have to understand like the, the fact that transaminases can work both ways. It's a reversible reaction, a reversible enzyme. And then this will all make sense. So glutamate, we've already seen this. Uh, so we break down amino acids, we break down nucleotides, we have a bunch of ammonium. You combine it with an alpha ketoglutarate, you make a glutarate. I would know 
glutamate dehydrogenase. I would know that that is the enzyme to do this. Um, a transamination reaction, in general, is just we take an amino acid and a keto acid. All right, what's a keto acid? Well, a ketone is where you have, you know, here's your carbonyl carbon, and there's a carbon on this side, and there's a carbon on that side. So that's a keto part. What about the acid? Um, well, this is uh, my carbonyl, and, you know, my alpha carbon is a carboxylic acid, a keto acid. Um, and it, it's really just swap it. The amino acid is going to become... Uh, some keto acid because we're just swapping the ammonium for a double bond O. So amino acid becomes a keto acid and the keto acid becomes some random amino acid. Um, so just one specific example, right? That's the general thing is let's take glutamate, an amino acid, and pyruvate, a here's our carbonyl carbon, is a ketone, and alpha carbon, it's a carboxylic acid, a keto acid. Let's take these and let's just, let's, sw let's swap. NH2 becomes C double bond O. And the, the double bond O becomes an N2. And, and you know what? And glutamate became alpha ketoglutarate, uh, uh, an alpha keto acid. And the alpha keto acid became an amino acid alanine. So, like, do you have to memorize every, like, what keto acid becomes, where, who, where, why? Nah, no, not really. Maybe, maybe just know the ones that were I talked through in this lecture. I think that's really all you'd have to know. Um, so... We, we talked about transaminases. This is a specific one. Who cares? Why is it important, right? Well, glutamate might be, might be a good storage for ammonium, but we're doing this in the muscle. I don't, I, I, yeah, I don't want to store it in the muscle. I want to get rid of it. How do I get it to the liver? Um, glutamate's not allowed through the blood for whatever reason, but alanine is. Alanine can move through the blood. So we convert it into alanine so that it can go to the blood so it can get to the liver. So, um, you know, it's, it's nitrogen, gets stored alpha ketoglutarate to become uh, glutamate. Um, it also makes alpha keto glutarate and glutamate. That might be make it easy to remember. Um, that though can't move through the blood, so we turn it into alanine. Alanine can move through the blood. All right, what's next? Well, just you know, reminder: uh, enzymes and, and reactions can work both ways. It's it's often they're reversible. Um, so we saw that alpha keto glutarate can become glutamate. We saw pyruvate can become alanine, but it goes both ways. So. We saw alpha ketoglutarate become glutamate. Uh, we, we need to pick up that nitrogen. And then we said, yeah, well, let's move it through the blood. So then the glutamate becomes this, and that allows us to generate alanine. Okay, well, alanine is going to move through the blood. It's going to go to the liver. Great. Well, now it gets to the liver. We don't need alanine anymore. We, in fact, want to do another one of these reactions with the same thing. It's just reversible. I want my glutamate back. Why do I want my, want my glutamate back? Because if I have my glutamate, I can also do the reverse of this just to make my ammonium uh, you know, pop up uh, and just, I, I just have it now not attached to some other molecule. Um, this is so we can input it into the urea cycle. Um, also note that the pyruvate, we can just do gluconeogenesis with this. We're in the liver and we can ship it back to the muscles. So um, just to, to, to so uh, we're going to have glutamate and it is going to help us make alanine. Alanine moves through the blood to the liver um, yay, we're going to turn it back to glutamate. Glutamate dehydrogenase makes ammonium. We'll talk about that in a second. The, the alanine can, can become pyruvate, or does become pyruvate automatically in that, rea that transamination reaction. Gluconeogenesis makes glucose. You know what? The muscles are pretty hungry. They use a lot of energy. We can just ship that back to the muscles, and then, um, uh, you know, we can turn that into, to, you know, one, it's going to use this for energy, but it also might make pyruvate, which again can just be an input here. So that is the Cahill or Cahill cycle. Um, it's very analogous to something we talked about earlier, which was the Cori cycle, um, which isn't relevant here. It's, it's simply just, I'm putting it up so it's so you can make a comparison, an analogy, um, a connection, uh, that if I'm doing um, anaerobic respiration, lactic acid fermentation, glucose makes pyruvate, yes, that usually goes through acetyl-CoA, but not if you don't have enough oxygen, it makes lactate. Lactate can go through the blood. Gluconeogenesis means that I can get a glucose back and then I can send it back in. So Cori's cycle is very similar to the Cahill cycle, but the Cahill cycle is the only one that's relevant for nitrogen stuff. Um, so uh, overview, break down shit, get ammonium, put it in alpha ketoglutarate, get a glutamate. Yay. Oh no, wait a second. Glutamate is not allowed in the blood. Okay, we'll combine that with a pyruvate transamination reaction. That makes an alanine. Notice the names for these enzymes. Glutamate dehydrogenase, 
alanine transaminase. Why? Because we're making alanine. Alanine goes through the blood over here, comes to the liver. Great. Alanine's done its, done its job. Let's make glutamate again. We combine it with, you know, alpha keto acid with a, an amino acid. Um, uh, and, and this is a reversible enzyme, so it's still called alanine transaminase. And we make a glutamate which has an NH3 and a pyruvate. Gluconeogenesis makes gluvate, glucose, glucose goes through the blood. Boom, that's the Cahill cycle. Now, this glutamate can have a glutamate dehydrogenase, rip off the NH3, and uh, that is now where our story continues. So, great, we made an NH3, NH4, but like, again, we don't, we don't like it, it's toxic, so we need to do something about it. And well, that's where we're gonna put it into the urea cycle. Um, NH4 is here, put it in the urea cycle. Um, I very much would know that the first two steps of the urea cycle happen in the mitochondria and everything else is taking place in uh, uh, the, the cytosol, at least this part. We're going to see that this gets a little bit more complicated and I'm actually not sure where that second part goes, but I don't think the last. Though. So first two steps, mitochondria, last of it in the cytosol. Um, so uh, CO2, or, or sometimes said to be bicarb, uh, and ammonium are going to combine and form something called carbamyl, carbamyl phosphate. Um, they do this with carbamyl phosphate synth, um, uh, synthetase one. This is the rate limiting step. And I why one? Well, because there's a second one that works. Um, uh, again, this is in the mitochondria. The first two steps involving this feller and this feller are in the mitochondria. So this is in the mitochondria. We have a CPS2 for nucleotides that happens in the cytosol. That is important to know and to make that distinction. So CPS1 is the rate limiting step. It just combines carbon dioxide and ammonium. It is activated by something called NAG. NAG is really just glutamate with like, you know, some sort of like acetyl acyl compound on it. Um, when would we have a lot? Of, so glutamate is basically NAG. It's just like a modified glutamate. Um, when would this happen? Uh, if there's too much protein in your diet, you're breaking down a lot of protein and then you need to break down a lot of those amino acids, which means you have a lot of nitrogen to deal with. Um, but probably more likely is there's some sort of like starvation going on and your body's gotten to a point where it's like, you know what, we actually need to break down a lot of proteins and a lot of amino acids. So you have a ton of nitrogen and, and all of this extra nitrogen means that we must have more urea cycle happening in the liver to safely convert it into urea for excre excretion. So we take that carbon oil phosphate and we now are going to combine it with ornithine. So the name kind of makes sense because the, the reactions are ornithine and carbon oil phosphate. And so this is ornithine named after one of the reactions, transcarbamylase. So this is the ornithine transcarbamylase. And now it makes it citrulline, which is going to be outside uh, of the mitochondria in the, in the cytosol now. Um, now this is going to pair with like the kind of the Krebs cycle, but a little bit of other stuff. Um, so an aspartate is going to combine with the citrulline, which is really just going to finish the process to help us make urea. But where, the, where are we just going to get an aspartate? I mean, I suppose you could just, you know, how, how are we going to make our aspartate? What's, what's going to happen? Um, well, uh, we can actually have another entry point in terms of like dumping off nitrogens uh, for the urea cycle. So we have an amino acid over here, which we also want to get rid of that nitrogen. Um, and so this is going to be aspartate uh, transaminase, where we have uh, oxaloacetate, which is a keto acid, and some random amino acid. They combine, and we make a different keto acid and this. So in the same way that we just said alpha ketoglutarate becomes glutamate, oxaloacetate becomes aspartate. Um, and the, and the aspartate is, is going to become fumarate, but what, which really just means it, it's dumped off another nitrogen. And you really don't have to picture every single weird step that's coming in. I very much would just know that these are coupled and that there is a, there is a second entry point now for a nitrogen uh, th through this aspartate. Um, so uh, just, just to really highlight, uh, maybe not, <laughs> to make an important point, kind of a side note actually, um, alanine transaminase, in the muscle and of the liver. Here we're talking about the liver. We need a lot of it, right? Because alanine has been shipped through the blood to the liver and then, well, we don't want it to al be alanine. We want it to be glutamate so we can rip off the nitrogen easily. A lot of ALT there. AST, we said that's the urea cycle, right? Aspartate is an input. And to make aspartate from some random amino acid, we need AST. So a lot of this in the liver. Who cares? Well, this is, if a hepatic cell dies, AST, ALT, normally safely in the liver. But if it dies, 
they, the, the, the liver is sick or whatever, AST and ALT will spill out of the cell into the plasma. So we can use this as a marker for hepatic function or your liver pathology. I want to know how healthy you are and your liver is. I can use the amount of plasma AST and ALT uh, to, to help me understand. Um, now, for whatever weird reason, ALT is... So if, if you have a bad liver, both of these levels will go up. But for whatever reason, ALT goes up a little bit more than AST. Unless... It's alcoholic liver disease, in which case AST goes out more than ALT. And you remember this by thinking that you make a toast, oast with alcohol. All right, so here's everything again. Uh, let's just try to understand where, where things are coming from and where they're going. So the immediate, so urea, our, our whole point is to get rid of these little nitrogens right there. Well, you know what? If you look at an arginine, and there's two arginine. So the immediate, you know, where do the two nitrogens from the urea come from? They come from the arginine. Okay, but like, Originally, where did they come from? Remember, we're breaking down amino acids and 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 nucleotides, and so the uh, uh, um, the 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 you know here, here's our urea. This is what it looks like. Um, uh, this first nitrogen um, comes from the breakdown of the muscle, you know, and, and that's the glutamate, the alanine, back to glutamate, and then this is where the nitrogen comes in originally. Um, and then this other one we said was the aspartate. Uh, the aspartate is, is really what's contributing this second nitrogen. Again, this was like the, we had the, the, the two cycles together, like the half crabs and this, this is where the aspartate comes in. Uh, so what happens if we have too much nitrogen, too much ammonia? Um, well, how can it be caused actually? Uh, liver failure by far is the most common one. If, if you, if you drink too much, if you have hepatitis, um, if you have you know, fatty liver disease, uh, these things can uh, affect hepatic function and, and you, you can't do the urea cycle as well and you're just going to have ammonium build up and, and that, that's probably the main way. I would know this, uh, rel I mean, all of these genetic things are relatively rare, but it is, <laughs> there's a spectrum of, of rarity. All of these diseases are randomly rare, but this, this one's actually more common than, than some of the other ones. So ornithine transcarbamylase is an X-linked disorder and it causes something called erotic acid to build up. And this might seem weird because, wait a second, okay, I, ornithine transcarbamylase makes carbamoyl phosphate, the precursors are carbamoyl phosphate and ornithine. They, they you, you know, combines them. So shouldn't, if this enzyme is not work, shouldn't those accumulate? Yes, if that was, remember that this was, um, we had CPS1 and CPS2. So it turns out there's another use of carbamoyl phosphate that is in nucleotide metabolism. And so it actually turns out that the carbon oil phosphate is going to be turned into something called erotic acid, which we'll talk about in a hot second with nucleotide me metabolism. So ornithine transcarbamylase, X-linked disorder, erotic acid is going to build up. Uh, typically, if you have too much ammonium in the blood, that means your liver is not working um, and the urea cycle is not working. And so that means you're not generating as much uh, urea. So your, your uh, bun levels are going to go down. Um, what are the effects of this? It's mostly going to have uh, CNS effects. Why? Well, there's a lot of glutamine synthetase in the brain. Um, so we said alpha ketoglutarate can store one nitrogen, become glutamate. And then we said glutamate can store a second nitrogen, become glutamine. Why would there be a bunch of glutamine synthetase in the brain? Um, one is the brain's really vulnerable uh, and, for, and, and vulnerable to ammonium toxicity. And so uh, it, it can, you know, it's kind of the lesser two evils maybe that if an ammonium gets up there, it can just slap it onto a glutamate and have glutamine. Um, you know, it, ultimately it's going to backfire because this is going to cause edema, which we'll, actually, no, we'll talk about that right now. So glutamine is very osmotically active and it attracts water. So if you have, if you have a lot of ammonium, uh, your brain's going to turn all of that, you know, it's going to combine it with glutamate to let, make a lot of glutamine that attracts a lot of water. You get cerebral edema, which is going to cause symptoms we'll talk about in a second. So, um, you know, I guess, I guess that it's, you know, would we rather have ammonium toxicity in the brain or too much glutamine, which brings in fluid. Um, th so, so that, that, that is just one reason the, the, the way that I think about it though, is that, um, uh, Glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter of the brain. It's very common. And so eventually we want to turn off this glutamate or recycle it or do something with it. And so astrocytes, which are dealing with um, neurotransmitter metabolism, they're going to take those glutamates and they're going to slap on a nitrogen to turn them into glutamine for whatever reason. Um, so 
Again, all of this is simply to explain and help you remember why we should expect there to be a lot of glutamine synthetase in the brain. Nevertheless, again, the whole main actual consequence is that you have too much water, which, which follows all of this, this glutamine now that is accumulating in the brain, causes edema. And if you have too much fluid in the brain, you have increased intracranial pressure, too much pressure because there's too much fluid in the brain. This causes the optic disc on, on, on your uh, basically in your retina, in the back of your eye, to bulge. So now this is normal, and uh, this is a bulging one. It's actually probably better pictures than that, but this, you guys don't really have to know exactly what papillodemia is and what it looks like. Just maybe be aware of the term. Um, increased intracranial pressure can cause uh, vomiting, uh, speech, somnolescence, and you know what? The big one, asteriscus. So if you ask a patient who you suspect, suspect to have hyperammonemia, to hold out their, their arms and, and extend their, their wrists, they will start flapping their arms like crazy. And this is called asterixis. And it's, and it's very specific uh, and high yield uh, uh, um, as an indicator for, for hyper too, too much nitrogen in the blood.